Okay, I think that's probably our cue um, to say welcome everybody um, to this Bars Digital event uh, entitled Radical Connections. Uh, I'm Will Bowers. And I will be uh, kind of chairing the conversation and responding to some of the papers at the end before we have a larger conversation. Um, I um, will introduce our speakers uh, and then let them speak. Um, and probably not introduce the project in any uh, way because that's what we're here to hear about uh, and I'm no expert on the project whereas Nigel, Rosa and Sanya certainly are. Um, so in no particular order um, our speakers are uh, Dr Rosa Moussignat, uh, a reader in comparative literature at King's College London and a co-investigator on the Radical Translations project. Um, Rosa's got an incredibly broad range of interests from Goethe to Pasolini, but the two publications which I think are worth flagging up for what we're going to hear tonight are her 2013 monograph, Realism in Space in the Novel, 1795 to 1869, Imaginary Geographies, and a special issue of Comparative Critical Studies entitled Radical Transnationalism, published in 2018, which she co-edited with another of our speakers today, Dr. Sanya Perovic, uh, reader in 18th century French studies, co-director of the Centre for Enlightenment Studies, both at King's College London, and the principal investigator on the Radical Translations Project. She's written widely on the French Revolution, notably in the calendar revolutionary France, Perceptions of Time in Literature, Culture and Politics, 2012, and also on the revolution's effect across Europe in articles on the reception of things like Volney's Ruins, and on the processing of revolutionary failure in the works of Vincenzo Cuoco. And finally, Dr. Nigel Ritchie, who is a research assistant at King's College London and on the Radical Translations Project. He obtained his PhD from Queen Mary, University of London in 2019, and before that he was a non-fiction writer and editor. He's recently published on Jean-Paul Marat, who was the subject of his thesis in an essay entitled Jean-Paul Marat versus the Public Sphere, a question of savoir-faire in the collection Cité et Citoyenneté des Lumières, and has also published an Oxford bibliography on the French Revolution, which I looked at last night and thought was an incredible piece of work. Um, the full biographies of our speakers will be posted in the chat, and I've intentionally not introduced the project, as I said, because that's what they're going to do. And afterwards, I'll um, say a few things about it and ask some questions before we open up to the floor. Questions are welcome in the chat, or you can just hold them back and we can ask you at the end. So I'd like to welcome our speakers to talk. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I'm going to begin and I'm just going to share my screen. So let me just do that. Once that works, hopefully. Is that what people see? Yeah, okay. So uh, this project, so my name is Nastanya Perovic and um, this project does essentially what it says. Uh, it's a study of radical translations and we are looking at the transfer of revolutionary culture between Britain, France and Italy in the period of the French Revolution. Oh, sorry. Just, um, and we are a small research team uh, of historians and literary scholars, and most of our work um, has been done also in collaboration with King's Digital Lab. So, um, as I said, this project seeks to map the circulation of radical texts, people and vocabularies between Brit Britain, France and Italy, essentially through two ways. Uh, first, by identifying a corpus. Uh, for the moment, we have approximately 800 revolutionary era translations in our database. Um, and we're particularly interested in translations that seek to extend ideas of liberty and equality into new contexts. That's how we define radical. And uh, our database also has a, a prosopography of over 500 translators. And these range from well-known revolutionaries to pseudonymous or even anonymous translators. Um, uh, together, we hope that these two aspects of the problem of the project will help us answer the following questions. How do translation enable democratic movements to reach wider publics and cast themselves as part of an international struggle? And how was a transnational revolutionary idiom adopted, adapted, resisted, or in some cases rejected in the effort to create locally and culturally specific tools for action on the ground? So in addition to uh, mapping this three-way exchange of radical print culture, we seek to illuminate what we feel is still an obscure network of translators and their works um, using prosopographical data models, and I'll say a bit more about that later. 
And uh, together, these two aspects, the bibliography and the prosopography, we want to use them to extend our knowledge of the linguistic and cultural strategies of mediation used by radical translators. Uh, sometimes in this period, it's assumed that translators are passive, sort of just conveyors of revolutionary propaganda. Well, we want to uh, recover them as active um, mediators. Um, and with them, of course, the centrality of translation um, in understanding the French Revolution as a transnational phenomenon that goes across borders of all kinds. Um, and part of the aim of our project is also to recover this rather polycentric movement of translations as well as of people. Um, finally, we hope to show through close reading how not just uh, translation in a kind of positivist sense, but also how misappropriations and failures of translation can be used to reveal cultural fault lines, as well as demonstrate how cultural influence works in practice. So I should say that when we first began our project, um, we did face a number of challenges and the chief amongst them is that there is no pre-existing catalog of revolutionary translations, much less something, a corpus of something called radical translations. So we immediately faced the challenge of how to find our texts and how to define criteria for selection in a way that didn't predict the outcome and as well how to capture the time sensitive nature of radical translations because one of our uh, goals is to understand how translation itself can be considered an event or an action and that translation is not just a, 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 a kind of a container that you just move along. Um, and we did of course as all projects do um, have some starting points um, when we began, we, we began with a relatively classical definition of radicalism as including some, but not necessarily all of the characteristics that you see on the screen. Uh, we also had a core list of prominent revolutionaries who we knew were um, actively engaged, engaged in translation. And we had a core list of radical texts, many of them stemming from the radical enlightenment. Finally, we had some knowledge um, of important publishers, literary journals, newspapers, and records associated with radical circles in all three of our linguistic um, areas. But it quickly became apparent to us that we were dealing essentially with two broad categories. On the one hand, the category of overtly radical translations, and here um, the question was more to, to know when and where a translation took place as a way of understanding how the translator worked and why he or she might have chosen a certain text. But we also had a quite a large penumbra of less obvious cases. Um, and this is when a specific translation may be considered radical within a specific context of, let's say, censorship or repression. So one of our guiding hypotheses is that certain writers may have turned to translation when they were unable to express the revolutionary convictions, whether it was due to censorship, regime change or other events. And then there's the case of course of women translators who um, maybe we think turn to translation to express democratic ideas that they were unable to openly support. So in order to understand um, how a certain translation might be radical even when a source text might not be, uh, we quickly realized that we had to essentially correlate four data sets. Um, one, the texts, um, second, uh, our set of people. Third, uh, we had to have a really uh, fine and nuanced understanding of events. So uh, the political and in some cases, social chronologies as they developed in our three different contexts. And finally, we had to have a good understanding of place. Where did translations take place? Were they undertaken, for example, in prison while someone was in exile? And how did this relate also to the movement of translators? Um, I won't say much about um, the bibliography, except to note that it's it's highly detailed. Uh, we did use um, a controlled vocabulary uh, that, that came from the Library of Congress. So we're hoping that our database is compatible with other databases. Um, but I just wanted to point out uh, the kind of vast array of texts that we include in our database, which include not just published translations, but also texts presented as translations, self-translations, fragments of translations, particularly published in newspapers and the ephemeral press, and unpublished or even projected translations. And I think one of the interesting things about our project is that we really try to 
uncover um, the, the, the and, and get close to the speed of the revolutionary situation. And of course, when it comes to fragments of translation, you don't find these in library uh, catalogs. These are things that we need to find basically through reading um, a number of um, different types of texts. Another um, uh, element that I just wanted to point out is that we also created separate records where we describe the paratexts um, of all of our translations. Um, so in this um, project, we consider paratexts as active strategies of framing as places where the translator's voice can be found. And it was, this is actually Rose's idea, but we wanted to also not just provide a very granular description of the different types of paratexts that accompany these translations. So this ranges from cover pages to dedications, to epigraphs, to perhaps the use of a revolutionary date or an imprint of a Phrygian cap. Uh, but also we wanted to uh, make them, and Rosa will speak more about this in her part of the talk, uh, machine readable in a way. So we assigned to each of the paratexts a kind of function um, that we hoped would describe whether um, the translator was using uh, an introduction, let's say, or footnotes in order to reflect on the constraints of communication or was using it, for example, to reference groups of imaginary or actual readers or whether the main um, place for the translator's voice was in fact to show readers um, uh, how they could remove obstacles to their understanding of certain um, political uh, or social references um, or events. Um, so as I said earlier, uh, it's a two-pronged uh, project that we're doing. Uh, it involves a, a close analysis of texts, but also of people. And uh, we use prosopo prosopography, um, what some people define as a kind of collective biography, uh, in order not just to illuminate the lives of these people that we're studying, but also as an indirect means of research. So what do I mean by this? Um, we use our knowledge of lives and the networks, professional as well as uh, political and social of our translators in order to identify texts not yet known to us. And as I said before, this is especially important given that many translations were published um, in ephemeral media that, that you can't find through library catalogs. Uh, we also use um, our understanding of people's uh, networks and kind of social and personal identities in order to deduce our certain assumptions about motivations for translation activities. Um, this is not always an easy thing to do, but I think you get a sense of why someone might be writing or translating certain things if you also know who they knew and who they, 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 they spend time with and who was also uh, circulating their text. Uh, finally, we use our prosopography in order to shed light on anonymous, pseudonymous, or uncertain attributions. For example, by linking uh, an anonymous translator or a translator or an anonymous text to printers or other networks. And this is also important because sometimes in the revolutionary period, it was quite dangerous to, uh, to put your name out there. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, more oblique ways in which people uh, moved and communicated their ideas. Uh, finally, uh, this prosopography performs a public facing role. It is our sense, or at least my sense that revolution is no longer very visible in public consciousness. Uh, yet people are always interested in other people. And um, we've included thumbnail sketches of key translators on a kind of rolling series that we present on our blog called Lives and Translations. And also for certain um, uh, very prominent translators, we've included a discursive uh, biography alongside uh, just the sort of more machine readable record of, of the key elements of their lives. Of course, here as well, um, there were some challenges that we had to overcome and chiefly we had to adapt our, a method in order to account uh, for a rather vast range of people. So we have on the one hand, a fully engaged core of known agents. And we also have a number of less obvious people who may only have been sporadically involved in this project of extending uh, revolutionary ideas. Um, we also have a varying amount of information from extremely well-documented lives to uh, people that might exist only as a trace, uh, as, a, as a reference, as an initial, um, and so forth. Finally, translation is an activity that may be secretive at times, for example, if you're translating maybe Dolbach while you're in prison or something like that. 
or something that's openly expressed, again, depending on the time and place. And it can be either neutral and again, radical, depending on the context. And I think what's interesting about our database is a lot of people who construct databases present them as quite objective. And I mean, that's a, an important uh, element of a database, but we try to highlight through um, our filters and all of our, the different uh, uh, kind of tools that we give, some of the reasoning for why people appear in our database. And we actually have a lot of extensive notes uh, that the postdocs have been working um, very hard to develop uh, that explain more and contextualize a translation because that's very important for understanding how um, it might uh, have acted. So on that note, uh, just a few words about our events data set. Uh, one of the challenges as you may have gathered uh, already is to recover what we call the multiple temporalities of revolutionary experience. Uh, actually, when I first started, I thought we could just easily just take a chronology off the shelf and just put it in there and use it. But in fact, that's not possible. Um, if you're trying to use uh, or to do as we are, what's called a histoire croisée, you need to have um, not just different chronologies for the different um, national and linguistic contexts, you can't just rely on general political chronologies. And what we quickly realized is that we had to construct specific chronologies that are specific for our research project um, that consist of events that are relevant for both translation activity and the history of radical revolutionary movements. So, um, cause that's where we try to find this overlap. Um, so we essentially have constructed a typology of events. We have looked at censorship and repression, military occupations, regime changes, um, so that users will be able to correlate um, the translations that are in our database, not just against a timeline, but also with respect to the political climate um, to help people understand whether it was a moment of freedom or repression, um, what the Stimmung uh, or atmosphere of the time uh, was. Um, finally, I won't say much about the places data set because it's actually the least developed um, element of our project, uh, but just to say that, um, in a project like this, you want to correlate the movement of texts with the movement of people because people were extremely peripatetic uh, in this moment. Uh, and a lot of people uh, went in exile uh, numerous times or were going from place to place. And, and this would be something we'd like to do maybe in a future iteration, but for now, um, our places are largely inferred from the other data sets. So I think I'm going to stop here and then uh, pass it along to um, my colleagues uh, to tell you more about the digital tools and also to give you a sense of the people actually involved. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. I think it's uh, my turn. So let me... Share. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Great, so I'm going to talk this is actually uh, an exclusive preview. We haven't shown these visualizations to uh, anyone before. Uh, we've discussed them extensively as a team, but we, it's the first outing. Uh, so I'm gonna show you some uh, ways in which we've uh, tried to visualize the data as a whole. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk about, we have visualizations of various kinds. I'm going to talk about um, networks. Uh, network kind of graphs and network of agents. Yes. Um, so this is what they look like. I'm going to show you this. This is a static image, but uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit uh, how we think about them, and then I'm going to show it, show you the actual uh, um, program that we use. Um, so um, the translator's invisibility has become proverbial. Uh, it's one of the starting points for, it was one of the starting points for uh, translation studies as a discipline. Lawrence Venuti talks about this in, back in 1995. So we want to use these visualizations to make uh, radical translators visible, lure some of them out of the shadows when they are anonymous. And also uh, we, we, try, <coughs> we try to use them to help us write and think about the kind of social history of radical translations. Uh, so anonymity is a problem is a is a factor in our database as um, at the moment 236 so a bit uh, almost uh, a little bit more than half of our translators that we have on our database are actually anonymous uh, so we hope that mapping 
the social and intellectual circles in which translators operate it uh, can be a way to um, maybe even aid uh, identification in cases of anonymity and, and when information is scarce. Uh, so um, agent networks, um, let me explain a bit uh, what this is. Uh, it might look uh, uh, unreadable. So it, uh, networks are made of nodes and edges. And in these networks uh, in, uh, that we use, uh, nodes are um, represent agents. And in the radical translation uh, database, agents um, include persons, uh, people like authors, translators, publishers, and other contributors to resources, as well as organizations, such as political clubs, societies, and institutions of different kinds. So you get a sense here, this is from the uh, interface on the website of the database, of what kind of roles, what kind of uh, agents we have. Um, and it's important to remember that um, uh, agents and persons that feature in our database um, um, are only those who are involved in translation activity and the publication of translations or source texts. So otherwise important or famous figures uh, of the period are absent unless they have authored source texts or translations, uh, those that we've been able to locate so far. Uh, so these uh, networks that I'm going to show you are deliberately partial and skewed, they only link people and organizations who participated in radical translation as we define them. Um, and um, so it, it's, it's a bias, a representation of the, of the time period and of the literary culture of the period. And we, one of the things that we are interested in developing um, perhaps at a later stage is also to see, to compare our networks with uh, others um, that map more uh, well-known groups such as, for instance, the Republic of Letters or Fre Freemasonry. So what's specific about a network of radical translations and translators? Uh, in addition to persons and organizations, the agent networks also includes nodes that represent serial publications, so newspapers and journals, um, um, and uh, those are marked in yellow. And this is because we consider journals not just as instruments of dissemination, but also as kind of social hubs and political uh, circles. Um, and so you, here you have uh, the relationship types that we consider. Those are the edges that connect the uh, different nodes and they're based in um, nodes. This is the, the one I'm interested in today to show you. So the nodes relationship links two persons with any degree of acquaintance. So this can range from a cursory epistolary correspondence to actual kinship or marriage or so any degree of, uh, of, of, of relationship. And it doesn't specify the characteristic of the relation, but groups, uh, uh, um, in fact, it turns out that groups that were actually very close in real life can typically be identified anyway in the network because of the presence, because that that forms uh, a pretty thick area or cluster in the network. So it's a nice way of, uh, Sanya earlier talked about the problem of determining your own results uh, when you construct the database. So keeping it wide, uh, in, uh, we hope helps in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in relation to this, um, to this nose um, attribute that we've used. Um, so let's um, move to the, so this is what the visualization looks like, but I want to show you the, um, the active uh, graph, which is, let me switch to this. Uh, so this is the nose relation. It's the uh, network shown nose relations. So if you, uh, uh, this creates, uh, we find two uh, distinct clusters on the center right. There's a larger one with a kind of high density of nodes, edges and prominent person nodes and a smaller kind of loser one to the left of the image, which has a narrow connection to the rest of the graph. And if you hover over 
this is not yet a public resource on our database. It's more experimental, but if you hold, so I'm not going to share it with you because it's not ready yet. So if you, but the idea is that you hover over the nodes and you get information about who they represent. Um, and the bigger cluster you see is made up of uh, mainly French and British agents. Uh, organized around major nodes. This one is Thomas Paine, which is the bigger node, the biggest node of the uh, network. He has 110 connections. Uh, Brissot uh, with 68. Uh, Condorcet, 64. And then Jefferson and Franklin um, here. And Mirabeau, I think is here. So these are the larger, the largest nodes. And Payne, by far, is the largest one, the most connected agent. And his personal network, so if you click on him, it shows his personal network spans Britain, France. So over here is France, Britain, and the United States. And um, Jefferson and Franklin's nodes are almost conjoined, uh, which suggests that indicates that their networks look uh, virtually the same. And like Payne, they too act as kind of bridges. Uh, between uh, France and the Atlantic world, so nothing surprising there. Uh, what about the French agents? So Brissot um, and Mirabeau, they're both revolutionary leaders with extensive connections within France, as well as across the channel, we know that. Um, and, and the high level of interconnection between nodes in this area of the network, uh, combined with the prevalence of large nodes, so with more than 20 connections, Kind of suggests, I think, yeah, that French and English speaking agents involved in translation form a relatively kind of high profile and well connected group. And many of the French agents that appear here at the center of the network are in some ways uh, can be connected with the Girondin group of the French Revolution. So if we, if we can talk more about uh, that later if, we, if you're interested. Uh, by contrast, the Italian agents, uh, it's, this is uh, it's them over here, they form a largely kind of separate group uh, that is not um, as closely integrated within itself, so it's quite loose, and it's linked to the, to the rest of the network through uh, four main nodes. Um, we have uh, Filippo Buonarroti, Filippo Buonarroti, the famous revolutionary, uh, Salfi, I'll talk more about him uh, in a second, um, Alfieri, Vittorio Alfieri, and uh, Marc Antoine Julien, who uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, as well. Uh, so they're the main connectors. And then there's a, a few smaller ones, um, like the Abbe Gregoire and a woman called Elisabetta Camineri, Caminer Turra. Um, there are fewer prominent nodes in this part of the graph. The largest one is Salfi with 40 connections and uh, followed by Foscolo, the poet Ugo Foscolo with, uh, with 36. Oh, sorry. Um, so how to interpret this in the light of existing historiography? Uh, so first of all, um, I, for one, was surprised to see this kind of picture of Italian isolation given that France was so uh, well, present in the pen peninsula under the directory and later Napoleon, and in general, uh, the, the, given uh, the French cultural influence uh, throughout the 18th century was so predominant. So why are they, why, why is, are the Italian agents not more closely associated with French? Perhaps in the effort uh, of uh, locating radicalism uh, as a, ra a, a cultural phenomenon, we, we certainly have privileged translators working on their own initiative to further their own political aims. And that means sometimes or very often in conflict with uh, official French policies in the peninsula. So we have given very limited space to the kind of avalanche of government sponsored translators, uh, translations of things like laws, edicts, speeches that were produced during the French occupation, including only those that have uh, we associated with, uh, with radical libertarian uh, purpose. Uh, so for instance, uh, the Abbe Grégoire, he's uh, present there on account of his writings on the emancipation of the Jews and ecclesiastical reform. Um, 
and uh, Marc Antoine Julien is another one of uh, the French agents that act as bridge. Uh, and he was uh, active in Northern Italy and he was an ally of the Italian patriots and opposed uh, Napoleon's imperialistic plan. So we don't have here people like the generals of the Armée d'Italie, French commissaries, other functionaries, official translators that are actually politically, historically important, but we, uh, they don't uh, fall within our understanding of, of, of uh, radical uh, agents and radical translators. So uh, I want to look at uh, the other kind of bridges. Uh, they are um, uh, Philippe Bonarroti uh, and Salfi, and they are important, prominent Italian revolutionaries and conspirators who um, are well known for uh, conceiving of their political practice in international terms, and they took part in revolutionary activity across Italy. Italy, Europe, and lived um, for long periods of their lives as exiles in France. So that explains why they have connections on both sides of the uh, diagram, I would say. And maybe you, you want to know about uh, this woman, Elisabetta Cavinier Turra. She was a, um, a theater owner and producer of plays and a, tra and a translator and publisher of plays as well. And, uh, um, uh, and she also has a minor role in this uh, acting as a, as a, as a bridge. Uh, the sort of disappointing thing for me uh, so far is that we have no direct link between British and Italian agents uh, that we've discovered um, that among the data that we have in the database so far. So why is that? Um, uh, possibly it's because our cutoff point of uh, 1815 excludes the experience of many of the Italian radicals, including, for instance, Postor himself, who went to England as exiles after Waterloo. Um, so the network captures the state of play only in the revolutionary and Napoleonic period and uh, shows that uh, radical culture traveled predominantly via France in this, in, in this period. So what else do we see here? Um, uh, several disjointed components. This four-cornered uh, one here at the top is uh, particularly interesting as it shows a tight unit of Genoese radicals, rad uh, radicals from uh, Genoa, the city of Genoa, who are only connected to one another um, and they represent, um, uh, yes, I think the short-lived revolutionary experience there of the Republic, um, which had a limited impact uh, outside Liguria, the region, whose members, I mean, these people nevertheless translated, uh, participated in the translation and circulation of texts transnationally, because they, uh, they, they feature in our database as translators of works from the Radical Enlightenment. Diderot, Voltaire, and, and so on. Um, so um, let me just say um, a little bit more of kind of theoretical, an attempt at reflecting theoretically about what networks can uh, enable us to do within the project. Um, so I think one of the attractive features of the network, of networks in general, is that they can provide a multi-directional, non-hierarchical, non-genealogical model of knowledge. And this was important to us uh, as our project works specifically or tries to work, to work against the notion of a revolutionary culture emerging from a core um, and, and being re received by the periphery. Um, but the democratizing effect of the network view, although it appeared to fit well with our idea of uh, translators bridging communities and, uh, and of radical culture as a kind of collective effort from below. Um, it, however, they end up encoding power along different lines. And we've seen uh, that uh, uh, centrality and connectivity that are expressed by the size of the nodes and the density of, of edges that does express in a certain way influence and power, uh, whereas marginal, less connected nodes uh, suggest peripherality, as we've seen uh, with the Italian agents. So in the end, the 
four periphery hierarchy, yes, maybe inevitably reinscribed in the topology of the graph. So at this point, the question that we have to ask ourselves is then uh, what the relative positions of nodes can mean within our particular network of radical translations. Uh, so if the center of the diagram is occupied by moderate, well-connected individuals, such as the Girondin, um, does that mean that then uh, it's the nature of radicals to be isolated and on the fringe? So we have to look at the, we have to kind of read the network against the grain if we want to, if you're looking for uh, radicals, paying more attention to the margins instead. Uh, what value should we assign to kind of quantitative considerations around the volume of connections and the flow of information across the network, given that we are investigating a qualitative phenomenon with high contextual variability? This is a big question for us if we uh, are thinking about the transnational element as well as the more grounded um, details about the context. So in other words, is radicalism necessarily a minority pursuit whose impact is best captured on a local rather than a transnational level? Or is there more, uh, any traction to our idea of a transnational radical culture? Um, and on the other hand, the way of a radical intervention um, might be incommensurate, incomparable to the number of agents or connected to it. So the impact of a, of, a, of a radical political practice, uh, does it depend on how many people are involved in it or, or does it not? How does that work? Um, considering the secrecy and constraints under which radical groups operated, especially in Italy, in Italy and Britain, it might, maybe it makes sense that they should appear as decentralized and distributed communities with few connections uh, to cultural hubs and centers of political power. Um, and then finally, uh, I think it was Tolstoy, I was thinking about this today, and who said, you know, important people, Napoleon, the Tsar, they, in War and Peace, they are um, uh, connected to many people, but because with connections comes responsibility, they are not free. Uh, being at the center, uh, being connected, being at the center of a network means being kind of determined by it. So if you're looking for free agents, maybe we have to look at the less connected ones. Um, and I'm going to stop here. Uh, there are other uh, visualizations that we can look at later in the as part of the q and if you're interested, uh, like member of or uh, translated uh, relation and uh, yeah, perhaps if people if people can let me know in the chat as well which one they might be interested in looking at and I can, I'm very happy to show it's preliminary work but I'm happy to show to show them so I'm gonna stop here Um, can everyone see that the that's working okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Will, for a very flattering introduction. Um, so I'm just going to crack straight. So Sanya and Rosa have given um, a sort of a really um, overview of the project, and I'm just going to drill down right down into the database by giving a, a brief case study of one of our lesser known translators, um, an Irish priest called Nicholas Magid. And I'm gonna use his example to discuss um, French policy towards Ireland, uh, the use of translation as propaganda, and also to present a new angle on the exiled writer, Helen Maria Williams. So who was Nicholas Magid? Well, one thing he certainly wasn't, was a mere commie or clerk as he was described by Theobald Wolftone, Ireland's new envoy to France in his diary entry from February, 1796. Sorry, Nigel, um, 
if you uh, the, the the text is incredibly small um if you start the slideshow it might increase the size oh sure yeah um yeah slideshow is that any better perfect excellent oh Thanks. sorry i thought it was i, I don't no, know no, that's my fault i shouldn't have we, we shouldn't have all nodded like <laughs> and, and said that, that we could see it because we could see something but it wasn't full size okay uh, okay, so, uh, and, and in which um, Tone suggested that French-Irish relations was um, a business, quote, a business of too great importance to be transacted with a mere commis. Uh, and this was despite being told by the foreign minister that he could speak without reserve to the man delegated by the directory to negotiate on their behalf. And unfortunately, this became the image handed down to posterity, thanks to Tone's lively and self-romanticizing memoirs. Anyway, Magit uh, duly translated Tone's important memos or memorials on the current state of Ireland and what Ireland should do to smooth the way for French invasion. And as the archives reveal, he also added his own paratext to these translations in the form of a precy or summary and a suite with his own list of recommendations for the ministry, which included tapping up America's large Irish community for more cash and agents towards this enterprise. Tone's memoirs vividly express his annoyance with Magit's, uh, Magit's delays in translating his reports and he criticizes Magit's over-interference in Franco-Irish affairs, blaming it on a disproportionate sense of vanity and self-importance. The irony is not lost. And of course, most histories on this important relationship cite Tone as the pivotal figure. For example, Roy Foster's magisterial work on modern Ireland or Adam Zamoyski's Holy Madness, Romantics, Patriots, and Revolutionaries. And yet, despite the key role that he played for over 10 years at the heart of the French government from 1793, um, even being described by one British agent working for Lord Castlereagh, the Chief Secretary for Ireland, as, quote, one of the most active instruments in the French directory in everything that respects Ireland, there is no known portrait of Nicholas Magid, and his cursory entry in the Dictionary of Irish Biography barely touches upon the full extent of his career. But in fact, as this address to the people of Ireland shows, Magid was chef du bureau de traduction uh, près le comité de salut public. Uh, this was the centralized organ of government known as the Committee of Public Safety, where he worked for the foreign ministry. And then following the dissolution of this committee in 1795, he went on to work for the Committee of Public Instruction, taking responsibility for the translation and dissemination abroad of uh, pro-French propaganda and censored radical British texts that had been suppressed uh, in Britain. And to help him, he employed a small team of translators, uh, including his nephew, John Sullivan. And he had a very wide ranging responsibility, which included um, everything relating to Irish affairs, uh, the recruitment of British and Irish prisoners of war into Irish legions, liaising between the French government and Irish representatives such as Tone or Thomas Addis Emmett, and translating all their various recommendations for the ministry, as well as composing some of his own. And he also took charge of commissioning agents for secret missions to gauge the readiness of Britain and Ireland for revolution, um, including popular attitudes to the prospect of French invasion. And to this end, he was responsible for hiring William Jackson, whose arrest in April 1794 and trial for high treason the following year helped to trigger a series of repressive measures by the British government against all those seeking reform in Britain, including the suppression of the United Irishman and prompting one MP, Benjamin Vaughan, to flee the country 
after becoming embroiled in correspondence with some of Majit's agents. After Majit's brief imprisonment in June 1795, there was total chaos when there was no one left to supervise the production and quality of the Bureau's translations. So it is clear that he was absolutely integral to this operation. Following the downsizing of the Bureau after 1796, Majit began to moonlight a bit on the side, running a language school and producing translations to commission, including some literary ones such as Sullivan's 1798 translation of the anonymous romance Ransback as Theodore A. Olivia. And unusually, you can see Sullivan's name on the cover, despite the normal convention of anonymity for translations of non-classical texts. In 1803, Majit's stock was so high that he was, sorry, was so high with the government that he was tasked he was tasked by Napoleon on Thomas Paine's recommendation to collaborate with the American ambassador, James Monroe, on its purchase of the large state of Louisiana. And by the time he died in 1813, in his 70s, he had outlived most of those he worked under. Now, biographical information on how on earth Magit arrived at his key role at the heart of the government machine is skimpy to say the least. Uh, born in 1738 in County Cork, he was educated in France, probably at the Irish College in Toulouse where he trained for the priesthood. And here he may have met Bertrand Barrère, future president of the National Convention and a leading figure within the Committee of Public Safety. And he would later collaborate with Barrère on several translations. After 1791, Magid appears to have left his parish near Toulouse and come to Paris, where he established connections with an increasingly politicized Irish college, two of whose students he would later hire for his bureau. And he also became active in the radical network of Paris-based British and Irish exiles centered around the White Hotel, where he met the Delacrucian poet and playwright Robert Merry. Around 1792, sorry, in September 1792, he translated Mary's contribution to the national debate over the creation of France's new Republican constitution, a short treatise on the nature of free government. And in it, Mary argued that the French experiment was a necessary step for liberating Europe's enslaved peoples, especially Britain, mocking its template of democracy as a sham and contrasting it unfavorably to France, which he portrayed as a shining beacon of liberty. This translation almost certainly helped to advertise Magit's language skills, and this alongside his connections with Barrère and the newly appointed foreign minister, Pierre Lebrun, uh, another ex-priest who had studied under Magit's friend, Richard Ferris in Paris, may help to explain his subsequent appointment as the head of the ministry's new translation bureau. In autumn 1792, Majit began attending meetings at the anglo Aris Society, Society of the Friends of the Rights of Man at White's Hotel, which was presided over by John Hartford Stone and whose other members besides Mary included Jackson, the exiled Tom Pay Thomas Paine, now acting as the National Convention's informal advisor on Irish affairs, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, and Helen Maria Williams. Magic's signature can be found on the address they presented to the convention on the 28th of November, 1792, following a banquet they held to toast the nascent Republic's recent invasion of Belgium and offering their congratulation on their military victories. Then following Francis, following Francis' declaration of war against the rulers of Britain and the Netherlands on the 1st of February, 1793, one of Magit's first contributions in his new role was outlined in a memo to the foreign minister Lebrun, and he proposed the formation of an English revolutionary committee in order to detect the presence of British spies in France 
while at the same time vouching for the loyalty of others. He advocated a three-pronged approach to enlightening the British. This would involve, firstly, the re-education of prisoners of war. Secondly, promoting correspondence with its reforming societies, including the, such as the Society for Constitutional Information and the London Corresponding Society. And thirdly, exporting writings in favor of liberty across the channel using the same methods as banknote forgers. And we can get a rough idea of what sort of writings Magic had in mind by looking at one example of those he commissioned. One of the most interesting archival findings regarding Magic's covert activities concerns the exiled poet, writer, and salonier, Helen Maria Williams, author of a series of best-selling letters written in France, which was published in eight volumes from 1790 onwards, with almost simultaneous translations into French. And Magit's dossier personnel in the Archive Diplomatique in Courneuve has two memos addressed to the Committee of Public Safety from April 1794, written at the height of the reign of terror. And in them, Magit asks for authorization to publish translations of speeches by two of its leading members, Maximilien Robespierre and Louis Antoine Saint Just, having already engaged the services of Miss Williams, who is reconnue for une des premières plumes de l'Angleterre, for the task, halfway down the first paragraph. And the marginal note, the top left, reveals that the request was passed on to Barrer, who is designated as responsible for this kind of work. Citing uh, her fameuse ouvrage sur la Révolution Française, along with a civic certificate from Rouen, as proof of her Republican principles, Magit goes on to praise her translation of Robespierre's speech from the 5th of February, report upon the principles of political morality for its elegance and precision dans le goût anglais. And this speech, which laid out the moral principles underpinning the Jacobin government, includes the now infamous line beautifully rendered by Ms. Williams. If virtue be the spring of a popular government in times of peace, the spring of that government during a revolution is virtue combined with terror. Virtue without which terror is destructive Terror without which virtue is impotent. Terror is only justice, prompt, severe, and inflexible. And Magit tells the committee of his absolute conviction that the dissemination of this speech across the channel will have a huge impact on the English people and help to overturn the false portrayal of the French in the ministerial press as cannibals. He goes on to recommend that Miss Williams should also be tasked with the new translation of Saint Just's report from the 13th of March on conspiracy and foreign factions. And this was the speech that justified the reasons behind the government's prose prosecution of the extremist faction known as the Ebertists. And Magic complains that the current one lacks zing and that only Miss Williams' inimitable style would ensure that une fois connu en Angleterre, il y peut produire le plus grand bien. And Magic concludes his memo with an ominous warning, and one that reveals his perceived ability to influence government policy by promoting a quasi-utopian view of the hypnotic power of suggestion through translation. For he reminds the committee that the situation in England, Scotland, and Ireland is currently so volatile that it would take very little to tip it over the edge into full-blown rebellion. And he urges them to seize the moment by flooding England with writings capable of enlightening the people on their own true interests, as well as the guiding principles of the French Revolution, which have been distorted for so long. A second memo now confirms that the translations are ready for printing and reminds the committee that Ms. Williams' translation in particular will make 
la plus vive impression en England. And toute la correspondance anglaise, presumably from his agents in England, prouve la vérité de cette assertion. And then comes the kicker, confirming Miss Williams' voluntary involvement in this arrangement, for he recommends in point three that in reward for her unpaid work, dont elle veut se charger, that they use the English press in Paris to print these translations chez elle. For Miss Williams had a commercial interest in the press alongside her partner, John Herford Stone. He explains uh, in point one at the bottom that not only would such printing be cheaper as a French typesetter would charge double for a language he didn't know, but in point two, the use of an English typeface would uh, the use of an English typeface would terrify George A. Pitt by making them think that it had been published in England. Now, apart from the insights this gives us into Magic's backroom negotiations with the highest organ of government, these memos are fascinating because none of Helen Maria Williams' biographers appear to have noticed this collaboration which challenges her conscious self-fashioning as a moderate Girondin supporter and outspoken critic of Robespierre. Even one of her letters of, le even one of her volumes of letters, which was, was entitled Letters Containing a Sketch of the Scenes which Passed in Various Departments of France During the Tyranny of Robespierre, which is number two on this list, but with a slightly different title. And it blames the grim events of the terror on his hypocrisy and cunning. And it also challenges the conventional portrayal of Ms. Williams fleeing to Switzerland in July 1794 for fear of further prosecution, following a six week imprisonment of her family in October and November 1793. When incidentally, she also began her acclaimed translation of Bernardin Saint Pierre's popular abolitionist novel. Paul and Virginia, Paul et Virginie, um, which is number five on this list. Now, it's possible, of course, that um, Helen Maria Williams produced the translation under concealed duress from Magid, or with the encouragement of her partner Stone, glad for the extra work. Another commentator who also spotted this memo suggests that um, Ms. Williams' translation was a precondition for her, for her release from prison some five months earlier. Um, but Robespierre hadn't even made his speech then. But whatever the case, this snapshot of linguistic collaboration thrown up by the archives intrigues an alternative perspective on her carefully presented public image. And it is hardly surprising that she never advertised her secret role in presenting Robespierre's most notorious speech to the Anglophone world. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nigel, and uh, thank you to all our speakers. Um, as I said earlier, but some of you may not quite have been in the room yet, um, I'm going to kind of respond for a few minutes now to what's been said. Um, and while I'm responding, you can put questions in the chat or you can formulate questions in your head, uh, which, which to say uh, in a few minutes. Um, so I'd like to begin by just kind of thanking our speakers uh, and also thanking them for presenting this uh, project to us. Um, I think the decision to go ahead and open the website while it's in progress is an absolutely fantastic one. Um, it's fantastic because it lets you see into something earlier than you would do before, um, but it also lets you see how these projects go about their business a bit from the outside and what gets done and what needs to be done and how that works out. I think it's a kind of luxury that a published print published project doesn't have, I'm sure uh, Sanya and Rosa and Nigel will say that the, the problem with it is it means it can never be finished. You're always, you're always just doing a little bit more here and a little bit more there, but you know, these are the, the two sides of, uh, of something like that. And in the spirit of that openness, I thought um, the editorial procedures section of the website, uh, I'll put that in the chat or perhaps somebody else could put it in the, in the chat for me. Um, but the criteria for selection section was, um, really really interesting what 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 gets included and what gets counted as as radical um uh, i think anyone who knows romantic studies well knows that the word radical gets bandied about 
um, very freely. And I say that as somebody who recently wrote a book with the word radical in its subtitle and was very, uh, um, yeah, I don't know, conflicted about um, about using it. Again, like the spirit of openness of opening the project early, I think uh, the way that the project deals with that is amazing by kind of saying, well, we know that radical is is a is a bit of a, um, a catch-all term, and we actually welcome its catch-allness. Um, so that, that that our definition of radical is intentionally open um, to capture as much within its um, gamut as possible. Um, maybe we could talk about it in, in the in the questions, but I was. I was I, I wondered what space there was in the criteria for inclusion for things that were purely um, uh, literary radical, um, building on work by people like Peter Manning and Susan Wolfson about the intrinsic radicalism of certain types of form, um, that irrespective of the content of a poem or a novel, but I think mainly a novel actually, um, uh, sorry, mainly a poem, um, a translator's choice um, a form in which they put something can itself be radical. A decision to change a blank verse poem into couplets or more likely in Italian, uh, the opposite. Um, and this might get us to one of, um, if, if, if this is part of the inclusion, I guess, um, this might get us to one of those people who are Italian and had a direct connection to England uh, kind of meeting Rose's challenge to bring the network that was off to the left uh, a little bit more into the center. And I, I, for the slightly later period, I'm very interested in bringing that that network of people off the left much more into the center of um, conversation. Um, so if we did that, we could maybe think about um, guys in Apollodori, secretary to Alfieri, father of William John William Polidori of vampire fame, grandfather to Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Christina Rossetti, and all the other very famous Rossettis, um, who translated Milton uh, in the uh, late 18th century. Um, and I think it's a kind of interesting thing to think about Milton as a revolutionary, Paradise Lost, at least in the Romantic period, as a revolutionary poem, but also Milton as a translator and as somebody who worked um, as a secretary of foreign tongues, so worked in the business of political uh, translation. Um, yeah, I, I thought of one other person that I'll speak to Rosa about afterwards who might bridge the gap, but I think it's it's interesting the extent to which that gap exists um, is very hard to in, envisage um, and envision, um, but actually because it's a relatively cogent small data set small, not for me or, or for, for most of us, I'd imagine, but small for the kind of people that do data visualizations, you can actually really clearly see that that those Italians are are separate. Um, I also thought it was worth thinking about how an outsider uses the resource. I am an outsider. I have no involvement in the project, apart from thinking it's very good. Um, and so last week when I kind of got to looking at it, um, because these things can be quite daunting, I think, for, for users. Um, how you might go into uh, to looking at it. So I'll pop this in the chat, but I thought that the, both Sanya and I think Rosa spoke about this, but the uh, the major timeline, so to speak, is a really interesting way of just kind of starting off um, on the project uh, of what we might call, but I don't think we do call it any more kind of distant reading of seeing seeing all these things outlined. Um, and again, I'm betraying my own um, obsessions with things Italian, but the not only do you see in this visualization the what Rosa spoke about, about the kind of separateness of Italian, but you also see the kind of belatedness of it. So if you look at the timeline, it's not maybe until Campo Formio in 1797, or perhaps before that, uh, the Napoleonic crossing into Milan. It's the fifth of the little circles on 1796. Um, and I was really struck by that because there's a very, very good book, a very beautifully written book by Fabio Camaletti that came out in 2013, um, which begins with the Napoleonic crossing into Milan. And he says in that book, I quote him here, the act of writing could no longer be the same if a different kind of literature had been possible in Italy, different namely from the occasional sonnets printed on handkerchiefs, the ultimate reason had to be found in the date of 15 May 1796, which has opened an irredeemable fissure between a before and an after. 
I think obviously Fabio didn't see that timeline, <laughs> didn't have all this data, but that data absolutely beautifully illustrates that before and after. You look at the explosion of dots in blue and yellow after, and you look at the relative paucity of them before. And so one way is to look at the timeline. Another way that you might want to do it, which I did for a little while, was look through a person that you're interested in and then see how that person relates to other people. So two people I'm interested in are Foscolo um, uh, and Etienne Dumont, Swiss um, translator, but also popularizer of the ideas of Bentham. Uh, it's mainly how he's known. So you can look through a kind of person. And I think that's a quite obvious way of using the, the database. Um, but another one I was kind of interested in that the, the thing allows is kind of looking through by time so the way in which you can see how a work from before the chronology of the of the project gets taken up and used. So I was very interested in a translation of uh, Boileau into into Italian in the late 18th century. Um, so a kind of late 17th century anti-clerical work um, becomes a late 18th century anti-clerical work and. You know, anti-clerical poetry in Italian in the late 18th century is kind of Casti and Perini, and it's very different from Boileau in, in lots and lots of ways, mainly in a kind of idea of politeness. So the way that translation works to change completely the um, the cultural context in which something can be appreciated, you know, I'd imagine Boileau would be distraught to see that kind of forcing of himself into a company with people like Casti or Perini. Um, and that's just to finish off, that's a kind of uh, very, very romantic uh, concept for me. Shelley talks about it in Defense of Poetry a bit, that, you know, Dante wasn't really interested in, in God, you know, that was just the framework of the time he lived, uh, nor was Milton. And, you know, you, you need to bring these people within to your own cultural context and force them uh, into that. So I think searching the database by time allows you to see these these jumps and the, the problem of these jumps that translations um, make us encounter. Um, so I have got some questions, but I think it's uh, polite in these things to not take the first question. So I'm going to open up the chat. Okay, there is a question that I can see straight away um, from Lucia. Uh, Lucia, do you mind me reading out for you or would you like to say it? I'm really sorry, but I do have very bad audio conditions. No, so no, no. if you can read it, I'm, thank you a lot. I'm very, very happy to read it out. Uh, Lucia says, thanks for sharing this amazing project. Have you considered the possibility of expanding it towards the Hispanic world? I'm thinking of how revolutionary texts in translation were fundamental to the Latin American independence movement in the 19th century. So that's, that's a question. And you can also obviously answer anything about what I said before the question. You want to answer Samuel? I can start answering and then. Yeah, we've, we're, this project hasn't finished yet, uh, but we are thinking about different avenues that we can take uh, if we get follow on grants or if we get, get additional resources. Because even just with these three languages, it's, um, yes, it has been quite a task and um, databases are very expensive <laughs> to create and to maintain. But um, yeah, so expanding the linguistic range is one direction. And we're, we were thinking, yes, uh, German, but also, yes, uh, Spanish. And, Hispanic world. Um, another possibility would be to expand the kind of texts, so, so to keep the three languages but go deeper into or wider in the range of uh, so perhaps not just translation but radical texts in of all kinds and then so that we have so separate but distinct data sets that we can do comparative work on, um, do, do trans, uh, radical texts in translation behave differently than radical texts in the original? Can be one question that that kind of project can answer. Um, but um, we, 
do find sometimes it's frustrating when we were following leads that take us into different linguistic areas than the ones that we are limiting ourselves to and then we kind of have to stop there um, but um, and yes we haven't we haven't really gone to latin america because just, yeah. Lot, maybe yes yeah and i just want to say um <laughs> that that the, one of the reasons why we haven't gone um to, let's say to latin america is because of our time frame uh, that we 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 wanted to work with a relatively short time frame, and I think in terms of European history, it gets quite complicated towards even the end of our time frame. <laughs> Once you get past eighteen hundred, it gets quite complicated uh, because there's so many different factors um, involved. But just what Rosa was saying, I just wanted to say that even though obviously there's a pragmatic element when we came up with this project, there was also an intellectual reason for comparing Britain and Italy, um, and that was because. Uh, in the historiography, there's an assumption that Britain was the society least changed by the French Revolution, and Italy was the society most changed by the French Revolution. And we thought that was um, an interesting kind of comparative. We take two extreme versions, let's say, of, of a, a hypothesis and, and we compare them too. But it's also, we make a lot of arbitrary distinctions. Bonneville is someone who was very much involved in German translation. Germany is a huge uh, place that is obviously very important for France, for Alsace and all those areas. Um, so it does kind of skew our project as well to some degree. Um, but if I may, I just wanted to just answer a just really briefly. Um, Will, you, you were amazing because you looked at the stuff that I think nobody, everybody just looks for people they know already and they stick them in the database and you went for the timeline. So thank you so much for even looking at that because it was extremely time consuming I wasn't so much involved with it myself, but it was extremely time consuming and I just feel like so few people look at it. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and uh, you asked about uh, uh, form, formal questions. And when you do a project like this, it's interdisciplinary and you work with other people and um, it, people's interests are reflected in the database. So we have a lot of um, essays in the database because that's an obvious place to go, pamphlets and essays. Uh, and we don't have as much literary uh, range of literary works, for example, poetry that we that we know is out. Uh, we know that things are out there, but we just haven't found them. But we have a lot of cases or it's well known that, of course, novels. There's a case, I think, of Candide, where the, it was translated into verse. So it went from prose to verse. Um, novels were translated and adapted for the stage. That was quite a common thing that was done in the revolutionary period. Or things were put to music, which is another form of adaptation. And in this question about what makes form um, radical? Um, it, it makes me think of Jakobsen's point about translation. So you could, there's two ways you can translate. One is to explain in more detail and make things more concrete. And that often requires adding more detail or more words. Um, but the other way that translation works is in a very compact way by metaphorizing the language. And I think this is a huge area actually that hasn't been really looked at partly because we tend to, be interested in intellectual history and that tends to be more discursive. But I think uh, poetry especially is a wonderful place, but not just any compact form. It could be popular song, it could be um, other things uh, that requires you to metamorphize the language in the process of translation. I think that would be a really interesting thing to look at and go further and make a contribution to uh, for example, intellectual historiography, history, and, and other kinds of approaches. So that's all I have to say. Can I add some an example? Because I think Will was wondering what about how you know translating a verse form into a different one in another language, and it's just uh, Erica and I. Erica is here, who is our other investigator, co-investigator, who's um, in the meeting. Erica and I are working on a, um, on a case of a play in verse by uh, Marie-Joseph uh, Joseph Chenier, brother of the more famous André Chenier, who was translated by the Salfi person I talked a little bit about. And so the original French is in these Alexandrines that are quite spacious and uh, regular. And the Salfi translates very faithfully very doesn't make many changes but he translates in uh, blank verse 
so it's not rhymed. It's in decasyllables, but quite free. And the result is very different. It's, uh, much and Robert Mary does as well for that same play in blank verse as well. I think it yeah. becomes much more faster, more dramatic, more like something, yeah, more performable, more theatrical in a modern sense. Uh, so that uh, more maybe democratic even in the kind of appeal in my heart. Just an example. There is another question um, from, I, I, the name is encoded, but I'm going to go for Steph. Um, she says, thank you so much, really illuminating. This is a question for Sanya. Did linguistic strategies of secretive and radical translations involve the use of coded language? So I'm going to draw this and if, to, oh, sorry, did you want to ask sorry. two? No, and, and if so, what were the challenges in deciphering this? I'm going to throw this back to Nigel, because I, I wouldn't say that I haven't seen coded language, but there's definitely use of initials, <laughs> extensive use of pseudonyms, which is probably not the same as coded language, but sometimes appears as code. Maybe Nigel, you could say something about some of the struggles you've had to decode the extensive use of initials for the names of translators. So it's not quite the same question. I haven't found that. Maybe there it exists, but I haven't found coded language per se. But Nigel, did you want to maybe say something about? No, no, I was just trying to think if I had come across anything like that. Um, I can only really think of all the, the use of, but this isn't anything unique to our project, but the use of um, false publication, uh, places of publication, uh, where you don't want the government to know that it's from uh, within the country, it's being published within the country, so it gives it another place of publication just to throw them off the scent. Um, and then, of course, there are these wonderful made up publications. I'm trying to remember what it is, but um, one of our publishers, Richard Lee, Citizen Lee, I think, called himself Citizen Lee at the Cock and Swine. I may be getting this wrong, but it was anyway, it was a reference to Edmund Burke's famous, ref, uh, famous comment about the swinish multitude, which was also taken up by two of our other contributors, um, Daniel Eaton and uh, I think it's Spence who published these um, cheap political miscellanies, Hogswash and Pigs Meat. Pig, pigs Meat, thank you. Yes. So, anyway, so, um, but in terms of, um, yes, it's a complete nightmare. Initials, pseudonyms, there was a, there was a um, widespread sort of fashion as well for pseudonyms, um, often with classical connotations. Um, Sometimes it would just be asterisks with maybe one letter at the beginning or one letter at the beginning and one letter at the end. And do the asterisks add up to the number of letters in the name? You know, who knows? But um, there are reference works out there. Most of them stopped being published in about 1890. Uh, so it, it's, it's a challenge to, to decipher. But sometimes there are enough clues if you look closely enough. So for example, we had a play let me get this right, by Anton Lumiere, uh, Guillaume Tell, which was obviously became a really big thing during the revolution uh, with the whole trope involving rebelling against the tyrant king and freedom and, and everything else. And it was translated in the 1790s as um, a Helvetic lass. <laughs> I've forgotten the rest of the title. And, we, and it was by a Kentish bowman. And it took us forever to try to figure out why on earth was going on with this. Anyway, if you look on the website, we have a speculative um, identification with actually a character who does appear quite a lot tangentially in our networks. But if this was the only translation we've managed to pin him down on, which is Charles Third Earl of, Third Earl of Stanhope, later, later known as Citizen Stanhope. So that's, uh, yeah. And just on that note, uh, there's another, when Rosa was presenting, it's a kind of a side note, but um, the problem of presenting a project before we're finished is that everything is provisional. So one of the Italians that Rosa didn't mention is Zeno Zenobio, because he's not on that, it hasn't been updated, so you don't see it on the network. And I think he also went as, um, what, his pseudonym was an Italian nobleman. 
in London or something like that. The yes. Italian... but... no, well, no. I was, I was, I was um, when 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 Rosa mentioned that the, the trouble with Zenobio is he only seems to be interested in contributing to the British debate or translating British texts. He doesn't seem to be interested in making the bridge with Italy and Britain. Uh, and then he seems to get caught up in trying to reclaim his estates uh, after various uh, different countries invaded the Republic of Venice or whatever it was before. Um, and so he doesn't actually seem to have got directly involved in the Italian struggle for emancipation, although he got very um, involved in the British uh, reform movement in one way or another. Doesn't he have big problems with his migration status as well? Count Zenobio, doesn't he? Like like a lot of them do, Viotto, Foscolo later, didn't didn't the Aliens Act um, cause him some pretty big problems? Yeah, I think he was pretty worried about being um, uh, deported. Let's say. Well, that's possible, but um, he seemed to be a seemed to be constantly worried about money. But he had access to money. He was always traveling around, and then apparently he used to run up these crazy gambling debts from time to time. Um, it's, but it doesn't seem to doesn't seem to change his tone. He's still publishing, I believe, or translating after that Alien Act has been passed. But I'd have to I can I can dig that out more deeply. While we wait for a question or two, what about self translation? Um, so there's a guy called Augustus Bozzi who has a newspaper in Italian in London in the first 10 years of the 19th century and he writes a kind of an appeal to Alexander of the Russians and he writes it in Italian, in French and in English. But self-translation doesn't, how does it, basically that's just an example because how does it work with the thesis of the project? Because the kind of thesis of the project is there's something interesting about somebody else doing the translating and moving the context of it. So does self-translation make that a kind of no-go or? No, we do have self-translations, and I mean, our our co-investigator Erica has worked a lot on someone called Fantoni, who who uh, also engaged a lot in self-translation. I think um, in the Italian context, it's very interesting because Italians knew French, the elite Italians anyway, so there would be no need to translate really. So the question of it, it, there's two questions like why do you translate when people can read anyway, <laughs> um, and then we do have I, I'm trying to find now as a category I don't know if Rosa is faster at it but we have how many self translations in our database, um, we have a number of them, and it's a it's a it's an interesting category for us, because why would you, retranslate yourself? What kind of effort are you trying to communicate into who? Um, I think it needs to be answered on a case by case basis. Um, but it's not that you're trying to get other people's ideas. Sometimes you're trying to take advantage of an event that happened elsewhere to open up, like well, the way I understand radicalism is you take, sometimes you can't do stuff in your own context. So you take an advantage of an event happening somewhere else to get to the roots of your own understanding of social and political inequality. So in that, that work of self-reflection, you would, you could very well engage in self-translation as well. Or you would be in exile and you want someone else to read what you've written, for example. So just kind of we have 13 13 yeah there's oswald mara mara translated his own work into in, well i think actually patrick but maybe he's here too he, he i know he worked on this he translated did he write it in french but it was first published in english and then he was translated back into the... Uh, we, we basically don't think we know. The chains of slavery. Yeah, I, I mean, someone assumes that he was, he was, he was self-translating from, um, from French to English, but I haven't seen anything dis decisive upon that, on that yet. So <laughs> thanks. I have a question which I put in the chat. I don't want to monopolize it. We hope to find more Sorry. translations and the self translations are great for translation theory. Yeah, because you got yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you so got good. all the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> you don't need to worry too much about it. Yeah. yeah. Um okay, so Patrick put a put a question in the chat, um, which is a very interesting one. Um 
that I think gets a little bit addressed in the yeah. the criteria document. What are the limits of the geographical place scope? For example, are Ireland and Switzerland incorporated in some way? Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, particularly the status of Ireland and the status of within the United Kingdom and things like that. So I, I uh, sorry, guys, go ahead, Rosa. I think, are you thinking about Italian speaking Switzerland? I think we have some like from Lugano uh, newspapers. They were very important because people yeah. used to smuggle via Switzerland Italian language stuff. If you look at the places, it's extraordinary because especially on the Italian peninsula, it goes to such a detailed level because of what Rosa said, the newspapers. So many places would have newspapers and sometimes they would retranslate something that's already available because they, they wouldn't have access to it or they wanted to translate it. We don't know that much because this is the problem of doing such an ambitious project is you don't always know all about the historiography. Ireland was an important place uh, for the reprint culture and uh, we had a big discussion about whether to include reprints when we first started, whether that would distort our data or not. And then we decided to include it because we thought um, if someone chooses to reprint a translation, that could be also a relevant thing. Um, so we do have um, uh, not Ireland necess We haven't looked at Ireland as a source of translation per se, because most of the things uh, that pass through Ireland are actually published elsewhere as well. And that's what we found so far. Um, but if you look at places, uh, I have to say, because I didn't even know about all these different places, especially in Italy, it's so many places um, that it's just my ignorance, towns like, you know, that I hadn't heard of. What's that Vercelli one? Yeah, yeah, Vercelli, you know, towns are so small. So we, we the place, um, we didn't restrict place, let's put it that way. We have as many places as we find and places um, tend to be places of publication. So if we find a translation that's published somewhere, it's it's in there. But it's fair to say we haven't parsed like the Irish journals per yeah. se. That's, yeah. We haven't done yeah. that. We've yeah. only included Ireland and North America when exactly yeah. when source material or translations that were published in the geographical areas that we focus on. Yeah, and same thing with Philadelphia being an important place of, of reprint culture as well. Um, but I'm not saying that there isn't some interesting stuff going on there. It's just that we didn't necessarily haven't gone there yet because there's only such a small number of us in this research project. Oh, I, can I so there um, just I just was just desperately trying to remember something I came across the other day, which originally I had marked down as Philadelphia in exclamation in um, inverted commas, and it was um, Benjamin Franklin Bash, who is um, is it Franklin's stepson or or his his real son? But he's a publisher, uh, and there's some debate about whether this was the true place of publication or a made up one, uh, because it was um, Jefferson's translation of Volney's Ruins, which Jefferson wanted especially to keep um, to conceal his his identity, given that it was quite a controversial, deist, free-thinking, um, quite politically uh, controversial work. Um, so yes, and without uh, copyright too, um, there was a massive amount of, of pirating going on in Ireland and America, and some of the London publishers would try to cut their losses by making deals where they would agree to ship out um, loose papers or, or even just cut the publishers in America in on deals to create a relationship between them. Uh, and there's one uh, London publisher, De Boss, who is very um, busy in importing French literature. So he's always the first person to have something important like Rousseau or, or someone like that. Uh, I think there is one we have time uh, for one final question, uh, and it's a uh, one that is oh, um, and it's about um, I guess how texts get across borders. So, um, how did radicals avoid postal interception across national borders? A kind of nice um, reminds me of kind of eighties and early nineties history books about the book trade that are still incredibly important. Um, yeah, what, what, do, you, do you have any evidence of 
people getting the, the problems of people getting texts out of the country um, in order to translate them or things like that. But one one example that that um, uh, is Helena Maria Williams when she uh, published uh, her reflections on on what was the name of the title on the state of France. She included in it a memoir by an Italian radical um, that she had translated into English. So it's a case of another person's memoir, and it's a very critical of Nelson um, and the events that happened um, in, in Naples. But you have a case of a text that has a text within it, for example, it's one way you can do it. And that was then translated almost immediately into French. So that's an example of something that was Italian, English, and, and French. Um, and then I think, um, uh, obviously, people carried things with them, I guess. Uh, and people were very, very, um, very mobile. So I don't think it was a case that translators necessarily were sat in one place and things went elsewhere. They just went with, or they their newspaper went with them, or 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 so on. So I think this is why the prosopography for us is so important. And what uh, Rosa said, the journals, especially organizations, are hubs of sociability where people would have also um, exchanged um, information and and uh, text as well. Um, I don't know if anyone. I think Nigel has this example of smuggling boats as examples of how texts also. I went. just, yeah, I came across a reference to these uh, very well-established networks for uh, main, mainly um, forged banknotes, but I'm sure other types of smuggling. And um, there was an ex-Corsair who was, had a position in the French uh, Marine Ministry and it seemed that Magit and him thought this would be the most effective, but I've not been able to actually follow that trail it's just references to using them i do have a very good story about um this cross-border um text and particularly like um a cautionary tale of how not to do it uh, and it goes back to um the story i was telling about magit and wolf tone and two years before wolf tone uh produced his famous memorial which is in all the history books um Archibald Hamilton Rowan also produced a memorial, which is barely um, known about. And um, he uh, sent a copy, or at least William Jackson, who had been commissioned by Magit to go to Ireland and to find out what was going on. He'd actually commissioned it from Hamilton Rowan, who was a member of the United Irishmen, to write this memorial on the state of Ireland and what could be done. And um, despite advice to be very, very careful and to publish, to post them in different sealed envelopes and to go miles away, he just basically walked to the nearest post box and pl plumped the whole lot in. And, um, and then they was basically picked up the next, intercepted the next day. And that's how he got busted and ended up on trial for high treason. I mean, it was just an act of absolute sheer stupidity. Um, but we do, we do, there is a copy of Hamilton Rowan's uh, memorial did finally somehow get to Paris, and there is a copy in the diplomatic archives uh, in French, not in English. So whether he self translated it or whether somebody else anonymously translated, we have no way of knowing. It's incredibly interesting. Um, I'm going to, uh, I think, draw our conversation to a close. Uh, and let us all either use the little emoji that says uh, clap or clap on screen for uh, Rosa, Nigel and Sanya for an amazing presentation about an amazing project. Thanks for all the interesting questions. Thank you. And thanks, Will.